To begin our story, let us look back America in the pre-depression period of 1928 and 29. It was a golden age. The United States was the only nation to enjoy a prosperity boom after the First World War. The 1920s brought a stern decade in which America became a Goliath of industrial achievement. The factories and the mills operated at top capacity. It was a period of full and profitable employment for all. The great and far-flung fields and farms were rich and abundant in produce. Choice herds of livestock covered the lush grazing land, and America's wants and needs were more than satisfied. It was an era which made the United States the richest country on earth. Skyrocketing prosperity and economic optimism filled everyone. Up and up piled the wealth of the nation. Some economists began to feel that things were getting out of hand. In early October 1929, the boom bubble paused. On October 23rd, it stood still. The next day, it exploded. The panic which seized America paralyzed the nation's economy overnight. In one day, over 12 million shares of stock were dumped on the market. Banks closed, and millions of people lost their life savings. Disaster cut down the small and the big businessman alike. The great American transportation system stood still. Rows of empty freight cars and miles upon miles of lifeless track bore mute evidence of widespread commercial paralysis. Thousands of factories shut down. Idled machinery rusted and fell apart. Workmen of every class were unemployed and helpless. That which the American people had considered security and prosperity vanished into nothingness. But America was still a land of plenty. Plenty of wheat. Plenty of corn. Plenty of all the basic raw materials from which to produce the needs of life. But economic chaos had strangled America. The purchasing power of the people was gone, and the supplies grew useless and rotted away. Amid these conditions, the saints reflected on the counsel of the church leaders down through the years. Counsel on thrift and security, and the desire to work and produce. Under the leadership of President Grant, the church authorities set forth to design a plan that would lift the Latter-day Saints out of the throes of depression. A survey was made of the economic status of the people in all the wards, states, and branches throughout the country. And at the April Conference of 1936, the presidency formally launched the church welfare program. It was a program in which the individual would be helped to assist himself and his family. It was a program in which every Latter-day Saint could participate to provide assistance to the needy. With determination, the people set to their task. The Relief Society sisters quickened their efforts in the making and mending of clothing. The men and boys of the priesthood set their hearts and hands to the raising of vital food supplies on whatever ground was available. The size of the fields wasn't important, but the purpose was. All were dedicated to maximum production for the use of the saints in the welfare program. The women rallied to the call to preserve that which the men had grown. Slowly but surely, the welfare plan gained momentum. Geared first to supply the wants for food and clothing, it soon supplied 10% of those immediate needs. More and more, the saints came to realize the importance of it, that it meant fully as much to the brother with plenty as to the brother in need. 
committees working with the First Presidency set up the Welfare Administrative Offices at 19 West South Temple Street in Salt Lake City to efficiently handle all matters pertaining to the administration of the church-wide self-help program. They then began to reach out for experienced men and women to guide its growth. From all over the church, the finest leadership available was drafted into responsible positions. The welfare plan was now to reach far beyond the bounds of the local wards. The architects and engineers planned the buildings and equipment as carefully as the authorities had planned the program. This was to be Welfare Square in Salt Lake City. Started in 1938 and completed in 1940, it became the pattern for many such units throughout the church. The concrete for the cylinders of the huge elevators at the square, which now hold 318,000 bushels of grain, was poured by volunteer workmen working 24 hours round the clock. The job was finished in eight and one half days instead of the 15 days which contractors and engineers estimated were necessary. As men and women throughout the church caught the spirit of the program, more projects of a permanent nature began to take shape. At Kaysville, Utah, the Saints purchased and put into operation a flour mill capable of milling 60,000 pounds of flour and 120,000 pounds of livestock feed per day. In Idaho, Priesthood quorums joined together in the operation of large farms which produced thousands of tons of wheat per year. Wheat to be placed in their own storage elevators for future needs throughout the church. At Murray, Utah, an ultra-modern dairy was erected. Its production capacity was found to be 540,000 pounds of milk per year. Then there followed a 130-acre dairy project at Hailstone, Utah capable of producing 530,000 pounds of dairy produce per year. The milk from these dairies has always tested exceptionally high. Rich acreage for beef farms was acquired along the banks of the Jordan River in South Salt Lake and stocked with choice herds. Following close behind these projects came church-owned chicken ranches to supply the initial need for eggs, poultry, and baby chicks. Turkey farms were started. Hog farms with clean, well-constructed sheds and sanitary concrete floors in the feeding pens were set up a few miles west of Salt Lake City. Special barns were built to house new arrivals, such as these stubborn, camera-shy little porkers. In Arizona and California, beautiful citrus groves were purchased. This one fronts the temple at Mesa, Arizona. These, with many fruit orchards like this one in northern Utah, were soon added to the growing list of the welfare's permanent projects. As the projects grew, so grew the desire of the Latter-day Saints to work in them. The planting and the reaping became more and more the pride of ward members the youth of the church began to feel they too were a part of the program. They found fun and companionship in the good work they were doing. And of course, time to occasionally sample choice bits of the harvest. Truck gardens grew from corner lot size to acreage proportions. The cool mountain streams now traveled long furrows to water the valuable crops which the men and the boys of the priesthood quorums planted and grew. Men of the city and men of the field united in the effort to draw from the land the finest produce their harvests could yield. Land that was once useless, as was this, was drained, worked, and made fertile and productive. Additional steps were soon taken to prepare for the clothing needs of the people. As rapidly as possible, departments for pattern layout and cutting, together with modernly equipped sewing centers, were set up. Capable instructors were engaged, and the women were taught the art of making clothing, from cutting the pattern to sewing on the last button. Assignments for kinds and amounts of clothing were given various Relief Society groups. Sewing became a major effort in the welfare program. The clothing was inspected, folded and stored away 
to be given out only upon a bishop's written order. A plant of the latest design for the pasteurizing and condensing of milk was set up at Welfare Square in Salt Lake City with the efficiency of the men and the quality of the produce second to none. The maximum capacity of this processing equipment is 3,200 quarts of fresh milk and 7,000 cans of condensed milk for every eight-hour day. In conjunction with a pasteurizing plant, a bottling unit capable of supplying 3,000 quarts of fresh milk per day was put into service. A large-scale cannery for the processing of fruits and vegetables grown on welfare orchards and farms was erected and put into operation at Welfare Square. It was the first of its kind and was to be used as a pattern for many more throughout the church as the program expanded. And by now, it was growing and expanding, picking up daily in pulse and tempo, becoming an integral part of the lives of many Latter-day Saints. It was a plan of self-help, not charity, guided by men of vision and inspiration, keyed to the utilization of modern machines and methods manned by God-fearing men and women with a love and craving for security and peace of mind and a strong desire to serve themselves and their brethren. The stockpile in the storehouses grew, stocks of food fresh and preserved piled up and up. Poultry frozen for future use was properly wrapped and stored away while the racks of the big storage refrigerators were made heavy with rows of choice beef and pork from the welfare farm. Canned foods filled the shelves as from the fields came fruits and vegetables, prepared and preserved at the canneries and bearing the welfare brand name of Deseret. Flour and cereal supplies were added too, and stocks of clothing from the sewing centers began to fill every available space. The increasing momentum brought stocks of dresses and blouses, stocks of suits and shoes, stocks of coats, stocks of almost everything for the needs of life. Not for the markets of the world, not to be sold for profit or gain, but prepared and stored as insurance for the unseen needs of the saints should disaster strike. Disaster like the Gila River flood of 1941, or the one at Vanport, Oregon in 48. By early 1939, things were looking good. The specter of depression and need faded. Even among some Latter-day Saints, a feeling of absolute security crept in, and they began murmuring against the welfare plan. They felt it had served its need and purpose. Seeing, our storehouses are filled, and all our people gainfully employed. The welfare plan has done its good. The church can now do away with it. 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 So echoed the words of some saints throughout the land. The welfare plan has served its need. We can now do away with it. of the people of the world. Church 
authorities repeatedly warned that soon America would find herself involved. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor. Overnight, America was in the thick of it. The Second World War ended on August 14th of 1945. America and her allies in victory went mad in a wild, spontaneous celebration. But victorious celebrations could not hide the havoc which war had wrought upon the continent of Europe. The gaunt, shattered, ghost-like walls were only skeletons of cities that once stood and breathed. Disease crept across the land. And want reached into every home. Famine fell upon the people. And the homeless wandered, dazed and wounded. Like the other peoples of Europe, the Latter-day Saints felt these same horrors of the war. Nearly all they possessed was torn from them, and they were left in need, desperate need. President Smith went to Washington in November of 1945 to open the way for the shipping of welfare supplies to our people in Europe. At the close of the war, I went to Washington to see President Truman. The reference to sending <coughs> some help to the people in Europe. He said, that's wonderful. Seems to me like it could be nothing better and we'll do anything we can to be helpful. I said, all right, Mr. President, we'll go ahead with it. He said, when do you have it ready? I said, say, ready now. He said, are you all ready now? I said, yes, plenty of it. We have car loads of it, but we can ship any day as soon as we can get it ready. Put it in the car. He said, all right, we'll be glad to have you do that. Go right ahead, and we'll be glad to improve what you're doing. The government complimented the church on its far-sighted program, and the way was opened up to reach the saints abroad. With all haste, goods were prepared for shipment from Welfare Square. Large groups of volunteer workers poured into the center to load the first train. Food, clothing, and bedding had to be gathered crated, addressed and loaded into the waiting freight car. As often before, welfare supplies were again on the way to saints in need. The first shipment left Salt Lake City on February 15, 1946. It was only a crust compared to the total need, but it was the beginning and opened the way for vast quantities of other supplies which later followed. From the city in the tops of the mountains, the big engines nosed their way up Weber Canyon and out onto the prairies of the great Middle West to the eastern seaboard. Arrangements for shipping had already been made and soon the cargo from Welfare Square was on the high seas. The shipments which followed drew heavily on the welfare stocks in the storehouses. But the saints in America doubled their efforts that those in Europe might be better clothed and fed. For such is welfare in action. Even as these destitute grown-ups and youngsters were receiving Red Cross assistance from America, the needy saints were receiving welfare aid from the church. Supplying the wants of the saints in Europe taught us in America that there is great wisdom in preparing today for tomorrow's needs. Today, there are over 250 permanent projects in operation in the welfare plan. There are hundreds of others sponsored by quorums and wards to assist in their local needs. The plan is no longer a small effort toward security. It is now a mighty program capable of supplying 80% of all the materials required by the saints in need. 
There are now 132 all-purpose farms comprising more than 6,000 acres for corn, beans, tomatoes, turnips, and the like. 500 acres more are planted in small vegetable gardens. Another 91 acres in beans and 150 acres in sugar beets. With additional acreage in ordinary table beets, olives, walnuts, grapes, cotton, sorghum, and berries. Preserving of fruits, vegetables, meats, and fish has long been one of the strongest points of the welfare plan. Many church-owned canneries and storage units have been erected, and many other canning projects are operated in privately owned canning plants, which are made available to church members. Usually, only a percentage of the total production from canning projects goes to the central welfare stockpile. The remainder is distributed among those members who have participated in the work. All types of basic farm crops are being added to the program. Eight alfalfa farms totaling 240 acres, five barley farms of 86 acres, and 20 grain projects totaling 800 acres are now permanent parts of the welfare plan. Over 2,400 acres of wheat are planted and harvested each year under the most modern methods of crop production. The men know the wheat must be good and the yield great, for from these vast acres comes the grain for the bread and the cereals of the welfare program. These will be milled here at the Kaysville Mills in Utah. To walk through these mills from floor to floor is to stand in awe at the size and efficiency of this project. Here, amidst a maze of conveyors, rollers, sifters, spinning wheels, and chutes, the wheat is made into flour for every use and purpose. The mill operates a complete laboratory for the analysis of its products. Wheat is carefully checked as it comes in to determine its quality and use. To date, the welfare program has 19 beef farms covering nearly 3,000 acres. These are operated as regular ranches for the purpose of preparing and fattening stock for the program's meat supply. Strict adherence is given to the government's regulations for the health and care of the cattle. A bovine youngster has his troubles in big operations like this. The odds are somewhat stacked against him, and amid protests and grumblings, he reluctantly submits to carrying the brand of the church for future identification. This mark, a simple LD, will do much to keep him at home. A routine injection for the sake of his health is in order. And he is up and on his way. Now a full-fledged member of the herd. Such care on the ranches assures the best meat product for welfare distribution. Eight dairies are now supplying over one million pounds of milk per year to the welfare program to meet its need for milk, cheese, and butter. Every care is taken to assure the most sanitary milking conditions possible. This machine for the shelling of peas isn't exactly new, but it is an example of the modern, efficient methods adopted by the welfare program. Vines and peas together are loaded onto the conveyor belt and taken into the sheller, where the peas are mechanically potted and shuffled on down into a chute from which they pour forth into handy containers, all ready for the canneries. Today, 27 acres of land are planted exclusively in peas. There is no waste, for here the stripped vines are stacked for stock and poultry feed. 11 permanent farms for the production of potatoes are in operation. These total 261 acres. A potato harvest is something like a three-ring circus with the kids and the grown-ups working along the furrows, riding the harvester and whooping and hollering as they pull entangled vines from the conveyor belt and help the spuds on their way toward the rear platform where they fall off into waiting sacks. There they are stitched up tight and carried away to the bishop's storehouses. To feel the inspiration and pulse of the welfare program, you should visit a permanent project in full operation one like the weaving mills in Salt Lake City, for instance. 
Here you are gripped with the activity and complex operation required in producing cloth. And you realize what a great service this might someday be to the Latter-day Saints. Here, as in every other permanent project, the church has permitted the installation of only the finest and most modern machines and tools. The operators have learned well the precision and dispatch with which they work is proof of their sincerity and desire to be of maximum service to the program. The program's initial effort in the manufacturing of shoes has been set up at Welfare Square under the supervision of an expert shoe craftsman. To make shoes, the program must have good leather and a tannery has been put into operation to work out the problems of supply. Proper equipment is being purchased as it becomes available and soon shoes will be made and distributed as part of the welfare plan. At the welfare soap factory in Salt Lake City, hand and laundry soap, washing and scouring powders, water softener and bluing are being produced. After going through the usual vat procedure, Blocks of soap are cut into big slabs, then into long strips, and finally into standard-sized bars for hand and toilet use. Each item is produced and packaged as attractively as any commercial product. Washing soap powder goes through a flaking process like this to be readied for household use. After flaking and final preparation, it is scooped into attractive cartons and correctly weighed. All this without even a sneeze. Ouch! Packages are then securely sealed and made ready for shipment in large quantities to the various welfare outlets. Near Orangeville, Utah, the church now owns and operates a coal mine. Here, as in other projects, Many men donate their time and skills to the program. From a high scaffolding at the outlet of the mine, the coal is dumped from the cars to go hurtling down the long chute toward the trucks below. This mine has been in operation for nearly two years and now supplies much of the needed fuel to heat and operate many welfare plants. Fleets of heavy-duty trucks owned by the church welfare plan, do regular duty between the mine and the church-owned coal yards in Salt Lake City. After loading, they are weighed and checked out for the long haul home. Throughout the church, the spirit of welfare work is growing. It is no longer merely a plan. Today, it has become welfare in action. In this, the atomic age, with its television, jet propulsion, supersonic plane, and other miracles of science, the Lord has shown the way for a miracle in cooperative human relations. There are those who wishfully assume that there will be no more war, no more famine, no more need for thrift and careful management. But the word of the Lord is like a trumpet of warning. This is an era of plenty. The saints must make it an era of preparation. Where today we have over 250 projects, soon there must be a thousand. Where a few thousand people are now participating, the first presidency calls for many thousand. The task is clearly before us. It is the way of security, the way of brotherhood. The welfare program is here to stay. <laughs>